Welcome to Eco Insiders. This is a show that brings you up close and personal with those at the forefront of sustainability and business innovation. I'm James, your host, alongside Richard, my co-host. Today, we're spotlighting the secondary metals industry, which is ripe for sustainability transformation. Meet our guest, Raphael, CEO of Metaikel. Raphael's professional journey started over two decades ago as a buyer management trainee in Germany. He then moved into corporate development for the group in the late 2000s. And in the last decade, he defined the inorganic pigments division at Lanxus from global product management to implementing strong digitalization initiatives. He eventually became the chief digital officer for the group in the APAC region. In 2020, he was appointed the CEO of the Chiho Environmental Group and Schultz Recycling. All of this background set the stage for Raphael becoming an entrepreneur and founding the venture Metaigal. This company is a catalyst for circularity in the metals industry, having the potential to cut CO2 emissions by 95% through the reuse of secondary metals compared to primary metals. Join us as we explore Raphael's innovative path with Metaigal and how it brings a global perspective to the metals recycling industry by developing a trading marketplace. If you like Eco Insiders, please leave us with a five-star review on your podcast platform. Now let's get into the concept and growth story of Metaigal. So yeah, around middle of last year, when Sebastian and I were then discussing uh, how to approach this topic of actually transforming the whole industry, right? Because we were uh, setting up a new company, Metaikel, but with a target to transform the whole industry to make it more efficient. So we set up the company, Metaikel, in middle of 2022. And we started out actually as a matchmaking platform, meaning we brought together supply of uh, scrap metals and demand for scrap metals, meaning uh, recycling companies. But we very soon figured out that if you really want to influence the process, so in this case also the digitalization process, you have to be an active participant in the industry. So that's the reason why in end of 2022, beginning of 2023, we pivoted our business model and we pivoted it that we become actually a principal in the transaction, meaning we really buy and sell the material. And here I would like to go back maybe a little bit. Why did we choose metals and not, for example, plastics, right? Both Sebastian and I come from the chemical industry and plastic, for example, is a very typical product from the chemical industry. Metal is very often a raw material for the chemical industry, but not so often uh, a product. And uh, here is one thing that is very important to understand is that if you look at it from a volume perspective, and then by volume, every year around 2 billion tons of metals are being produced, which makes it around six times more than plastics or paper that are being produced every year. Um, so by volume, metal is the biggest material that is being produced. And metals are used everywhere. They're used in, in infrastructure investments, in machinery, automotive, all kinds of investment goods and also, of course, in uh, consumer goods. And uh, because of this, the lifetime, so to say, of metal and its application can vary between a couple of weeks, if it's a beverage can or aluminum in a beverage can, to 10 to 15 years, the metals are used in automotive. But metals are also being used in infrastructure, which means in bridges, or in the railways, which very often have lifetimes of 40, 50, or maybe more years. So basically, we have a lot of metals that are today used in many different applications, and some become available as end-of-life products very soon. A beverage can is a good example. Some become available after they reach the end of life, um, after 10, 15 years, yeah, like a car or a washing machine and others uh, remain very long in, in their application. 
but no matter which application, at some point of time, uh, the application or the, the, the product in which it is used reaches its end of life. And the beauty of metals is you can recycle metals infinitely if you do it properly without quality loss, which already makes it different from most other materials that uh, uh, can be recycled as well. And the infinite recycling without quality loss is then combined with one thing, which is very crucial for the metal industry is if you use a recycled metal as a raw material for new metal production, then the CO2 impact is significantly lower because uh, when a metal is produced, uh, let's say steel or aluminum, the production process based on primary raw materials, which in the case of steel is iron or coal or coke, uh, limestone, mm, or if you look at uh, aluminum, the raw material is uh, bauxite, which becomes aluminum oxide, which then becomes aluminum. But this conversion process is actually a chemical process, right? And intrinsically, uh, these processes emit CO2 emissions. While if you have a recycled metal, so let's say a recycled steel or recycled aluminum, then the only only thing, uh, I put it in the apprentices, uh, that needs to be done is you just need to smelt it and it becomes a new metal again. So you don't have a chemical reaction, you have a melting reaction, physical uh, process. And the main input in there is electricity. And uh, the electricity that you put in from an energy perspective is much less than the energy you need in the chemical process of the primary production. That's number one. So you already save CO2 emissions there. The second one is because you use electricity for the melting, it depends on your mix of electricity generation on how big the CO2 footprint is, right? So you can have coal-fired uh, plant electricity, which is very CO2 intensive, but you can have photovoltaic or wind power or hydropower, which basically has almost no CO2 emissions. But even if I assume I have steel that I have recycled and am melting, then my CO2 footprint for the new steel that is based on this recycled steel is at least 60% lower compared to primary steel production, even if the electricity is generated by coal-fired plants. And if, if I have electricity that comes from uh, photovoltaic or from wind power, then um, basically the CO2 reduction impact is much bigger. I always also like to look at aluminum because there's a CO2 saving potential is much bigger if you use recycled aluminum as the raw material for uh, the smelting process, right? So there, the energy that is required to smelt recycled aluminum to become new aluminum is more than 95% less uh, than to produce primary virgin aluminum. So again, here, if you just assume you use electricity, which comes from coal-fired electricity plants, you have a CO2 saving of 95%. If you have electricity, though, coming from hydropower or from photovoltaic uh, solar panels, uh, uh, wind power, then your reduction can be up to 100% of CO2 emissions. This is uh, basically why I love aluminum um, as a packaging product. Because in packaging, you can endlessly recycle it. You can keep the quality. And each time you recycle it, your energy intake is significantly lower compared to the first production. Rafael, does this mean that we can be looking forward to, at some point in the future, uh, BYD cars that are originated from European scrap metal? Let's maybe look at the market as a whole first. And if we look at the market as a whole first, right, then globally we have metal production of around 2, 2.2 2 
billion tons. And um, if we look then what metals are being produced, so the majority, 90, 95% of all metals that are being produced is steel, you know, with almost 9 billion tons. I think last year there was around 1.9 billion tons of steel that were produced. Then we have around 100 million tons of aluminum that are being produced every year. And then we have copper with around 30 million tons and all other metals follow with much less volume. So uh, steel, aluminum, copper are the three biggest metals by volume and steel is by far the biggest. So if we look then on how much scrap metal is actually available every year as a raw material um, to produce those two, 2.2 billion tons of metals, then we see that it's around 700, 770 million tons per year. So roughly one third of the volume that we produce as metals every year uh, can come from recycled metals. Two thirds, and for this one we have to be realistic, still have to come from primary uh, raw materials like iron ore for steel or oxide for aluminum or copper concentrate for copper. Just a quick question. Is that split expected to stay like that throughout the decade or is this more of a, a current status quo and that may change over time? That's actually a very good uh, point, a very good question. The answer is it will change over time. So if we look at, for example, the United States and uh, metal production in the United States, it has been pretty constant over the last decades or maybe even decreasing compared to one, two or three decades ago. And then if you think about where metals are used, like infrastructure, investment goods, automotive, consumer goods, and so on, it means that if you have a steady production over decades, uh, that basically you have enough end-of-life scrap that becomes available every year uh, that you can use to be a raw material for this new metal production, so to say. So in the US, if we look at aluminum and at steel production, 70, 80, even more than 80% of the raw material recycled metals. And for this one, the US is one of the leading, if not the leading country that basically uses almost only recycled metals for steel, aluminum, and other metal production. So basically, we can see a real circular economy there. If we look at Europe, it's uh, different. So theoretically, um, Europe would also have enough end-of-life products because, again, if you look at uh, the, the metal production over the last decades, uh, you see that it's stable or even decreasing. So theoretically, there is enough end-of-life products available that can be recycled and reused in new metal production. There's one difference between Europe and the US is that uh, the US 30, 40 years ago transformed its industrial landscape away, for example, in steel industry from the blast furnace, basic oxygen furnace towards electric arc furnaces, which basically means away from this chemical process of producing steel towards uh, smelting a physical process. In Europe, this transformation has partially taken place. So if we look at Germany, for example, around 45% of raw material in steel production is scrapped. And the remainder is still iron ore. And the reason is that in Germany, for example, we still have a lot of those dust furnace, basic oxygen furnaces that uh, going forward will be transformed into those that can uh, run on other technologies. If we look at the whole of Europe, it's around 55% of raw material that is recycled steel, which means 45% in the whole of Europe still come from the primary raw materials. So Europe, in terms of this industrial transformation of the landscape, has not transformed as fast as the United States. And uh, so this would explain already why not all metal production is based on scrap metals. But if you take the 
70, 80 percent in the US and the 45, 55 percent in Europe, then it should be much more than the 30 percent or 33 percent I mentioned earlier. And there, a very important topic comes in. If we look at the last decades, metal production in China increased significantly. So basically, nowadays, metal production in China accounts for more than 50% of all metal production in the world. So very roughly, what we have seen over the last two, two and a half decades, we saw almost a doubling, maybe not exactly, but at least 80% increase in global metal production. And almost all of it happened in China. But then if you think back about the usage time, of metals. So if the increase in metal production over the last two, two decades took place in China, then there is not so much metal that has come back yet, let's say, which is mainly in infrastructure or in real estate, but even in automotive, it only starts coming back now. So to come back to your question, we will have an increasing amount of end of life goods end of life metals that can be recycled over the next one, two, three decades. But to be frank and to be realistic, in the next one, two or three decades, there will still not be enough end of life uh, metal scrap available to basically base all metal production globally only on recycled metals. Okay, right. Richard, do you have any questions? Yeah, Rafael, I'm curious. You mentioned earlier that you have a pivot moment couple of months after you launched this is, I'm curious, uh, before and after this pivot moment, like who are your early clients? Who are the early adopters to the business model of marketplace? We don't have to mention any names, but uh, it would be good to know, uh, to get a sense of the, the industry, the size and the location, etc. Yes. So that was actually interesting to see who became interested in the metallical marketplace. If we look at the whole market, no matter whether it's the scrap collectors or the scrap recyclers, it's a very fragmented market. And then uh, very often you have bigger players who are both scrap collector and scrap recycler. But nevertheless, their global market share is rather low. Um, so we basically both on the supply and demand side have two fragmented sides. And the companies or the early adopters, so to say, who started working with us were usually the small and medium-sized companies, both on the supply side and on the demand side. Because for this one, the bigger players, they have very often in-house trading operations that don't only focus on the region, let's say Europe, but often also have people who work on trading uh, scrap metals or recycled metals from Europe to Asia or from North America to Asia. But the smaller players on the supply side, they very often don't have this trading department that does international trade. So we became for them a very interesting partner to be able to offer or to provide their products because what we could bring in is we could bring in the demand side, which is a very fragmented one. It's dominated by small, medium-sized companies. So when we started, we were edge-making them, so to say. And there were suppliers who had scrap metals or recycled metals, and we had customers who had also scrap metals and recycled metal demand. But when, when you bring together supply and demand, especially as a marketplace, you have to be able to provide a sustainable value add. And if you just start your company, like at that time we just started with Heike, of course we had a lot of visions and a lot of ideas on what value add we can offer both from the buying and the selling side, but it takes time to implement it. So in order to prevent, especially bypassing of the platform, we then decided we become the principal in the transaction. We buy material, we sell material, and the transaction takes place via our company. Uh, that way, on the one hand side, we have much better control over the transaction itself. We can uh, much faster implement the value-add services. And with Metaikel, 
being a German company headquartered here in Cologne, we bring also a trust element um, because we, we are physically located in Germany. And uh, in addition, also, we, so to say, ensure the quality of the materials that we trade. So it's not that we just bring together supply and demand and have no influence or limited influence. If we are the principal in the transaction, then we also have to ensure the quality of the material. And that basically increases the trust, especially from the demand side into Metaikel. Is we consistently provide good quality material, demand for our products or the products which we offer is increasing. So what we are today is basically we are a managed marketplace. So we still have a lot of players from the supply side, a lot of players from the demand side. Both sides are growing, but it's a managed marketplace, meaning is we get involved in every single transaction that we do over the platform. Well, interesting. I'm trying to summarize like the key success factors. If you want to launch a marketplace business model in a very niche industry, it seems to me that you need to first start with a big enough size market, like the metal you chose over plastic and others. And you need to have relatively like fragmented markets where the, the buyers and the sellers don't meet quite often. And also you have to really build high quality service to make sure trust and to make sure the transactional process is trusted by both the sellers and the, the buyers. Exactly. Uh, you, you summarized the key points already. I would add one point, especially the point that is important when starting a marketplace. So if we look at the global metal market, it's like I mentioned, the 2.2. 2 billion tons in total size. The scrap metal market is then around 700, 770 million tons in annual size. And then if I put a dollar value behind the scrap metal market, so just the scrap metals without the recycled metals have a value of 600, 650 billion US dollar per year. So pretty sizable market, definitely big enough to start a marketplace in it. But then if you have such a big market, you need to focus on certain things in order to verify whether your business model works or not. And that is the reason that when we started then becoming the principal in the transaction, which was beginning of 2023, so beginning of this, of this year, we decided to focus on aluminum and end-of-life aluminum. Because this market is a fraction of the total scrap metal market, but it's still big enough from, from a volume size and it has also international trading lanes. So we decided to focus on aluminum and we decided to focus on the trade lane Europe to Asia. And this is a market that is a couple of a billion of US dollar in size per year. So it was big enough to have sufficient transactions in the market and to adjust our business model to be profitable and also to make sure that we add value both for the suppliers and for our demand side. And when we um, basically proved this point and, and made sure that it works in aluminum, we started expanding into other non-ferrous metals like copper, for example, um, because very often, if you look at metal scrap, mixed metals are very often a combination of aluminum, copper, and maybe steel components or other non-ferrous metal components. But this basically allowed us then to grow more and more. I want to go to the point where we ask in every podcast, usually at the beginning, and it seems kind of obvious, but it was really like, what was your aha moment? And the question really is here, it's kind of linked to why we're doing this podcast, because 
We think that in the future, there is only going to be a profitable company that is sustainable. And there's no point being just a profitable company because in the next 10 years, regulation might change, circumstances change, that your costs explode, that your stakeholders, your consumers turn against you. So so a profitable company today will have to figure out how to be sustainable. And the same thing like a sustainable concept that isn't very profitable yet. But in your case, it seemed like these were sort of joined at the hip from day one. The business case and the circularity case seemed so clear and so evident. How I have a bit of a two layered question here. And I think one is really the competition. So if it was so obvious, why did no one else do it? And then the other side is how do you feel like when you're driving this business case forward and in an exciting early stage of this new venture, how do you see this, the business case together with the sustainability proposition? How does that feature with the various stakeholders you're working with? And Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, if you want to throw another nuance over that, but I think that's the question. Yes, this is actually a very good point. So what we do at Metaikl is we bring together two or three mega trends, if you want to call it this. So one is the digital transformation of whole industries and whole life, so to say, right? And the other one, and that you can look at as one or two mega trends, this one is definitely the circular economy to reuse, recycle materials. And the other one, which is directly connected to it, is a reduction of CO2 emissions. And the beauty of metal recycling is that whenever you recycle the metal, you reduce intrinsically the CO2 emissions of the production process. So, so basically it helps um, a lot to reduce CO2 emissions. Maybe I, I would like to bring two numbers into here uh, to explain the impact of CO2 reduction, metal production. Metal production as a whole accounts for around 10% of all global CO2 emissions. And if we look at uh, the biggest producer of metals, uh, which is China, in China, uh, metal production even accounts for almost 20% of all direct CO2 emissions, which means that the fastest way but of course, there are limitations from the supply side. But the fastest way to reduce CO2 emissions in metal production is by using as much recycled metals as raw materials as possible. And because you have those 60, 90, 95% CO2 reduction just by using uh, the recycled metal as a raw material. So uh, we, we deal here with on the one hand side, the circular economy, the CO2 reduction. And like we discussed earlier, it's a very fragmented industry and it's a global industry. I think that's an important point, a very important point to consider is that it's a global industry. We have value chains or manufacturing chains that are global. We have uh, products uh, like, for example, the laptop I'm using here is made out of aluminum coming from China. But actually, the laptop is being used here in Germany, right? So on the product side, we have global value chains and global manufacturing chains now even becoming more prominent when you look at electric vehicles coming out of China. And every electric vehicle has more than 800 kilogram or more than one ton of metals in it. And they are being produced in China and an increasing amount is being exported Southeast Asia, Europe and so. And this means at some point of time, the products reach the end of life. And then basically the recycling flow, the circular uh, uh, flow, so to say, has to be also able to go back. But if you have a very fragmented industry, the scrap collectors who collect scrap, we think they don't distinguish whether the product was produced in Europe and North America or somewhere in Asia or China, they just collect the scrap. And uh, that's the reason why digitalization in this industry is so important, is basically to encourage as much scrap metal collection globally and make this scrap metal available globally as well. And this one you cannot do in an analog business model. 
because if, if you are working in an analog and traditional trading um, business model, then you don't have the overview, you don't have the 100% view on the market. That one you can only have if you have a digitalized business model. So the digitalization of this industry of circular economy is extremely important to make sure that the highest amount of scrap metals globally is being collected because we can connect it to the demand side and there is definitely a shortage on a global basis in scrap metals. But if you look at it from a regional perspective, there is more scrap metal available in Europe and in North America that can be consumed as a downstream metal production today. So this means it makes a lot of sense to collect as much scrap metal as possible in the developed world, that we call it developed world, the West, developed Western world, and make those metals or scrap metals available to emerging markets, which are mainly in Asia and also including uh, China. Because whether the CO2 is safe in Europe, in the US, or somewhere in Asia, doesn't matter for the environment. The CO2 saving always has a global impact. It's not a regional impact, it's always a global impact. It's a bit like there's a sort of a, a circular arbitrage between regions, because I guess you have, let's say, the three big trading blocks, US, China, EU, and then in those blocks, there is regulation and there are dynamics inside that region. I can imagine the, the competition for recycling in, in a particular market might be quite fierce. But what you're saying is we can, through a digital platform, make the case collectively like this is, there is a lot of excess resource capacity in Europe by way of scrap secondary metals. It's an incredible case to be making. Does that come across well with the regulators? And how, how are regulations helping you or not helping you in these various trading blocks? Very good point. So maybe first to the point, um, from if we look at it from a global perspective and put Metaikal into this perspective. So one unique thing about Metaikal compared to all other players in the industry is that Sebastian and I, as co-founders of the company, we are based um, regionally diversified. So in our interview today, I'm dialing in from Cologne, our headquarter. But my main base is actually China, while Sebastian is based in Cologne, in Germany, in Europe. So just from the setup of our company, we are already an international marketplace. And that makes us different from um, all potential other players. So there is, of course, companies who have as a mission to digitize or digitalize metal recycling, but uh, their regional focus or at least the origination is always either somewhere in Europe, somewhere in the US, somewhere in Asia. There is no player that has originates from two regions, Europe and Asia, as we do as Metaikel. So this already makes us intrinsically a global player and differentiates us from all other players in the market. Then, if we look at it from what you mentioned, uh, regulatory perspectives and, and uh, potential limitation opportunities. So very often when we explain our business model, people raise the point that, for example, the European Union is in the process of implementing the waste shipment regulation. One important thing to consider is that Metals or scrap metals are not waste. Yeah? They are secondary raw materials. And that's why when we communicate about the products which we handle, as we move more and more away of calling them scrap metals, we very more often call them secondary metals. That's because it's a secondary raw material. And the waste shipment regulation that the European Union is as a process of implementing, actually, if you are a global marketplace like us, is even of advantage for us because it doesn't forbid the export of scrap metals from Europe. In the process of implementation, it requires much more transparency on where did the scrap metal 
come from and where was it recycled and where was it used downstream, especially if it ended in non-OECD countries. And the best technology or the best way to bring transparency into this value chain is actually if you digitize or digitalize it. And in, in this context, the marketplace is just the best. We know who are our suppliers. We know who are our customers. We audit both, both supply and the demand side, which means as a marketplace, we have the best view on where the material originated and where it was used then. So basically, from this perspective, and if you read the waste shipment regulation in detail, especially the appendices, that even encourages marketplaces to be implemented in order to bring this transparency into the market. So I personally see this as an advantage. From a political perspective, there sometimes may be tendencies that uh, scrap metals are considered secondary raw materials. And if you have a raw material in the region in which you are active, you maybe don't want it to be exported to other regions. But here I would again bring in the point is our manufacturing value chains globally circular or have to be circular. Means we have a lot of products which are assembled across the globe with materials coming from across the globe. So in order to ensure a circular economy, we have to make sure that also the flow of the end of life products and especially the recycled products and in our case, the recycled metals is a global one. And here I would always bring the argument that I mentioned earlier is our target is to make as many end of life products, as much end of life metal scrap available for recycling as possible. And this can only be done if it's done on a global basis, because only then there's incentives in Europe, in North America, in other parts of the world to collect as much metal scrap as possible that it can be then used in regions where there is not enough scrap metal in the production process of new metals. Raphael, great. I have more, one more question about the business and really looking forward because you're obviously growing quickly and you're looking to scale in the coming years. What are the KPIs or metrics that you do that you use to measure the success of your business, except for the, the usual obvious ones with for you as the management team and the founder team and, and the investors involved, but just also metrics that you can disclose that are particular to the platform that you're running? So in 2023, we uh, had two financing rounds as Metaical. One a financing round we had in March 2023, where we raised what is called a pre-seed round of 1.5 million euro. And then in November 2023, we went through a second financing round with uh, new investors, but also the old investors followed up on the investment, where we raised a total of around 5 million US dollar in what is called a seed round. And then if you look at the, uh, what, what are the expectations from the investors and what are also the expectations from us and the founders of the company and where we want to move is, one is, of course, we want to grow our business. And that's the most important thing. Second is our business has to be intrinsically profitable, meaning that every transaction that we do has to have a positive contribution margin. Otherwise, with the scaling that the loss would become bigger and bigger. And, and uh, for, for this one, basically, from the beginning on, it was the case for us, our margin on the transactions that we do are always profitable. You know, so we basically generate a profit on every transaction that we do. But we are scaling our business very fast and we are further enhancing the value adds to our customers via our platform. And that, of course, needs money. So that's basically where where some of the investments go in. And one of the value adds that we are implementing is, so to say, the assurance of quality. So this is also where we dive much deeper into technology. So much beyond just being a marketplace that, that offers products between supply and demand. So we, we basically also start implementing technology yeah, for quality assurance. 
And with the time also, we will be able to track CO2 emissions uh, or the CO2 emission savings. And uh, this gives a lot of um, additional value streams, which we can generate both for the supply and the demand side. Raphael, I'm going to ask you now if you could just uh, take off the hat as the, the founder and CEO of the company. And now you're an advisor for other new ventures that have a strong impact or companies that are looking to pivot, that are traditional companies that are looking to pivot quickly and become future resilient and lift impact. If you've mentioned that digital transformation and also particularly marketplaces, but maybe just looking at digital first approaches to deliver positive impact and sustainability, that that's kind of a prerequisite because we need to measure, measure things. And then once we measure things, we can start optimizing them. Do you have kind of general advice for companies in different sectors that would be wanting to make kind of meaningful strides in this? Yes, a very broad question and very difficult to answer it. But one thing, and, um, and James, you mentioned it also at the beginning, is if you want to be a long-term sustainable company, you of course need to make profit, right? But to make profit is you need to be sustainable from also an environmental perspective, which means any company that is active in any industry, but especially in manufacturing industry, has to make sure that it is working on the topics circular economy and carbon reduction or carbon dioxide reduction. Because these two points are the only ones that will make the manufacturing industry long-term sustainable and the players in those industries are long-term profitable. And uh, key learning from my 10, 20 years in the manufacturing industry and in the recycling industry is that in order to implement a uh, circular economy, uh, recycling topics, carbon reduction topics, the digitalization part is a very crucial one. Because the data that you need and uh, the conclusions that you have to draw, it's just too much to do it without any digital tools and uh, uh, digital systems. So I think we are in a decade right now and maybe also the next decade is where those two topics, circular economy and digitalization, converge and only the players in the industry who are able to transform the operations to allow those two things to converge and be part of the whole business will be the ones who can be long-term sustainable. Yeah, and typically in every episode, we want to actually ask the guest to, to kind of look ahead and to make either a kind of speculation or it could be an expectation, a prediction. Clearly, we can't predict the future, but so anything of what you hope it to be or what you think it will be, whether it's in your specific industry or just in general, I think what you just mentioned was really interesting. How do you think that's going to go and spill over across the, the mainstream of the business world? What are some sudden shifts that may happen? Or is this just going to be a gradual kind of linear form of progress towards increasing circularity in business? Or is this going to be actually, there's going to be a lot of clear winner and losers in some sudden, sudden tipping points in the industry or various industries? I think it's difficult to, to make a prediction on winners and losers here, but from a general trend perspective, the COP28 summit, for example, just took place in Dubai. And I think no matter whether you look at the producers of fossil fuels, or if you look at companies that only do green products, everyone is clear um, that over the next decades, we have to reduce CO2 emissions. And the question is only, in what time frame and with what technologies and with what impact to do it, right? I think everyone is clear that we have to reduce the CO2 emissions and become carbon neutral in the next two, three, maybe four decades. So the, the beautiful thing is that we have, this, we have this catalyst, right? It's basically pushes everyone now, especially uh, players in industries and manufacturing industries, to find for ways or to look for ways on how to reduce the CO2 emissions and bring them towards zero. And the 
faster the players can do it. On the one hand side, the earlier they become long-term sustainable. So this would be one of the things that I would say looking at it from the outside. And the second one is you need to use the right technologies, right? It's, there is always technologies which you can implement, which can be implemented very fast because they already work. But at the same time, you also need to look at technologies that are maybe not available today, but you know that with the technological development over the next decades will become available and then will help you at a certain point of time. But you have to find a balance of both. What can I implement today? And what will I be able to implement in 10, 20 years down the road? I think one example of, of like 10, 20 years down the road is, is, is if I look at this carbon capture and storage. Everyone's talking about it, but at least I do not know many examples where it has been implemented in a profitable way. But if we look at it, especially in the industry, the petrochemical industry, the fossil fuel industry, and so on, this will become a very crucial part to make those industries carbon neutral. Yes? So, so it's a combination of what can I do today, but, but what do I have to work on that I can implement in the next 10, 20 years? Yeah, and when I was mentioning winners and losers, I mean, to clarify, I think increasingly that the word competition, well, it still exists, of course, in a functioning market, that is not, not necessarily a competitive advantage. I mean, competition can be gained by collaboration, and I think collaboration is increasingly important. That said, there is somewhat of a race, whether it's a collective race or a race to get to a certain point as a company. So it's similar to companies digitalizing in the last decade that they have to get there faster to remain competitive. I guess it's going to be interesting. When I mean winners and losers, I guess there's also that intangible aspect of it. Going back to your point earlier about change management and being able to make change as the only constant. I mean, we can keep going. But one other thing that we want to ask is for listeners is any resources, books, reports, newsletters, documentaries, anything you'd like to recommend and leave, leave for the listeners to dive into. And we'll put that into the show notes as well. Maybe to understand the global circular economy, there is one book. It's already a couple of years old, so it's not the newest book on this topic. If I'm correct, it's 10 years old from 2013. It's uh, called Junkyard Planet, and uh, it was written by Adam Minter. And uh, the subtitle, so to say, of this Junkyard Planet book is Travels in the Billion Dollar Trash Trade. This book, uh, written in 2013, gives very good insights on how global the flows of secondary materials, scrap materials, and it's not only metals, it's also other products that he uh, looks at there. In my opinion, the best book to give you like an impression why is circular economy a global uh, business. Then another book, it's more looking from a primary raw material side and how dynamics work in, in the primary raw material industry. There's a book which is called The World for Sale. And it was written by Javier Blas and uh, Jack Fartry. And uh, the subtitle of this book is Money, Power and the Traders Who Barter the Earth's Resources. Very good book uh, to understand on how primary raw materials dominate our world and uh, which also, if we look down 10, 20, 30 years down the road, will also be the case for secondary raw materials because the amount of secondary raw materials and total production will continue increasing. Then I can only recommend anyone mm, to look into this resources of industry associations. So if, if you look into the resources of the steel, global steel association, world steel, you see a lot of statistics on um, where steel is being used, how environmental friendly or not friendly it is being produced, what are the potential to reduce so I will provide you an overview of links that uh, give a lot of information on this. And if you look at those resources, in the end, they are pretty consistent. Yes, what material is being used? What is the CO2 impact? And, and, and how global is the market? So those resources are something that I will share with you and you can share in the podcast because it gives a pretty good view on where we stand now and where we can move over the next 10, 20 years. 
That's great. So that's just perfect, Raphael. And well, thank you for, for joining Richard and myself on the show today. And I really wish you and uh, Sebastian, your, your business partner, Sebastian Denner, both a very successful uh, journey ahead. And we look forward to staying in touch with you and to seeing how your company will scale and evolve in the coming year, in the coming years. Thank you so much, James. Uh, thanks to Richard for inviting me. It was a great discussion. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for the latest episode of Eco Insiders and our conversation with Raphael. If our conversation struck a chord with you, we'd be thrilled if you could leave us a five-star review and share your thoughts on your platform of choice. If you have a guest in mind or feedback to share, just drop me an email at james.loudon at iot1.com. Loudon is spelled L-O-U-D-O-N. And finally, if you're looking to spark a research strategy or workshop initiative and you need a fresh perspective, the team is just an email away. Thanks for tuning in and see you on the next episode of Eco Insiders.